Don't you just appreciate them? Awesome. All right. Well, today's an exciting day. This marks the first day of our fast. Did you remember that? Well, I'm going to remind you. I have a really exciting but very practical teaching for you this morning on, uh, on fasting and prayer, and I'm going to cast a little vision. Um, as I was preparing for this fast, really the past month, I've been thinking quite a bit about it and praying about it. The Lord's just been um, just giving me all sorts of scriptures that I want to share with you this morning. Some I'm going to read, some I'm just going to touch on. I really want to encourage you to take out your notepads or your phone or wherever you take notes and write down these scripture references so you can be studying them during the week. If you got your bulletin this morning and you actually opened it up, you would see that there's an insert in the, in the bulletin. It says, Fast Forward 2018. Um, Pastor Laura and I have been talking and praying about this, and she put together some passages of Scripture. She started today with Habakkuk 2, 1 through 4, which I'm going to read at the end, end of service. I just have some things that I want to share with you with regards to that passage to kind of set you off for the, for the week. But you can use this to pray into and for guidance throughout the, the week. There's a portion of scripture passages, um, some whole chapters, some just verses, for each day of the week, and I want to encourage you to at least participate in reading the passage of scripture and praying for um, yourself, your family, and uh, as the Holy Spirit leads as you read these passages of scriptures. At least do that. But I'm believing, by the end of the service, that all of you are going to be participating in this fast also. Um, there's seasons and times in, 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 in Scripture that uh, particularly the Israelites, but even the early church, would call together a corporate fast. And that's what we're doing. We're encouraging all of you to be involved. Some of you may have health reasons why you can't avoid certain things, but I'm sure you can participate in the fast somehow. And I'll be talking about fasting a little bit for those who you don't know much about it or haven't practiced it before. I'm going to show you the biblical context for it. It's very important. Um, it's, uh, it goes hand in hand with uh, effective prayer. And uh, so I'll be sharing a little bit more about that. Let me, uh, let me pray and I'll get right into it. Father, we just thank you for uh, your guidance, your direction, your faithfulness to us. Lord, you don't leave us floundering. You're there through your Holy Spirit to, uh, to give us direction, to give us guidance. As we read your word, Lord, we know that your, your Holy Spirit helps us to discern and understand your word and apply it to our present day. And uh, Lord, I'm just believing the next, the next two weeks that it's going to be a powerful time for us as individuals uh, Holy Spirit, you're going to speak to us. You're going to give us pictures, dreams, visions, prophetic words. Uh, Lord, I just know that you promise us in your word that when we seek you, we will find you. And that we will hear from you. So I'm believing, Lord, for powerful revelation for the next couple weeks. And uh, Lord, we just pray, as always, that your will would be done. In Jesus' name. Amen. So the next couple weeks, we're going to participate in something, at least I'm going to do this, and I know many, many of my friends that I've already talked to are, are, are going to, we're going to practice something that's a little oxymoronic. We're going, to, we're going to fast, but at the same time, we're going to rest. And what I mean by an oxymoron, when I think about fasting, it, it brings up a little bit of anxiety in me. Because, you know, I like food. And uh, I've really been dis disciplining myself really the past year to, to, to eat healthier. I've always been a pretty healthy eater, eater but to, to eat healthier. So in some respects, I've kind of been, I've been kind of working my way into this for the past year. So it's going to be much easier than it is in previous years. But, you know, to deny yourself your fleshly appetites, I wouldn't like necessarily say is incredibly exciting. Um, so... You know, thinking about fasting and thinking about resting just don't seem to go hand in hand, but I can assure you that they, that they do. And as unpleasant as it may seem to deny yourself, 
I can guarantee that there is great reward when we do that. It's one of the fruits of the Spirit, the character of the Holy Spirit, self-control. And for, for a believer, a Christian, um, it is important that we learn how to be self-controlled. We learn how to be patient. We learn how to be long-suffering. And one of the best ways to do that is to participate in a fast. And I would encourage you, and I, I really believe by the end of the service, it's not going to be something that you just do once a year. Um, we'll do this corporately throughout, throughout the year, but I believe it's something that you're going to be doing frequently because I think that you're going to experience incredible breakthrough the next couple of weeks. Not just because you're fasting these two weeks, but because this is a, this is a way that the Lord calls us to himself so that we would honor him and he would communicate revelation to us and guidance. So um, I never feel more empowered is when I fast. There's just something unique about it. My personal experience, whenever I've participated in, in, in a fast, it's like, it's like I'm running on NOS gas. It's just, you know, I... I, I, I I, I, I have no, no problems overcoming temptation. I just feel like, I feel like God is just speaking to me all the time, and I don't think that's just unique to me. I think when, when we, we say, Lord, we're going to honor you in this. We're going to deny our fleshly appetite so that, that you can feed our spirit. And Lord, we want to hear your direction. We want to hear your will. We say that. We pray your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, and then we go off and do our own will the rest of the week. Because we never seek for his direction and seek for his guidance. And uh, we really need to begin to start practicing a fasting lifestyle. This shouldn't be just something that we do seasonal. It should become a lifestyle. That was, that was Christ, really the theme of the message in the Sermon on the Mount, which I'm going to touch on in a minute, was that, that our hearts be changed and not, we, we not do things just by duty or out of tradition, but that our hearts are so transformed that we begin to live a lifestyle of prayer, a lifestyle of fasting. We obey his commandments because we love him, not because there's going to be some sort of consequence. God wants to change our thinking and change our heart, and I believe that fasting is going to become something that we all regularly do. First, I'm going to define fast. The English language really messes with words because when you think about it, the word fast... If I say fast, what are you thinking of? Well, now you're thinking of, you know, yeah. But you're thinking of running. It's kind of an odd word. So I actually, I, I'm always curious about words like word origins. So I had to figure out what, why on earth would you call denying your fleshly appetites or denying yourself from eating, eating food fast? And it actually comes from an old English word. I think it's pronounced fastin, F-A-S-T-A-A-N. And it means to be firmly fixed, steadfast, constant, or to make firm, establish, confirm, or pledge. So when you think about a fast, that's what you're doing. You're making, you're making a pledge. You're establishing something. And I believe that you're establishing the fact that you know, you're, you're telling demonic forces, I am not going to be swayed against this. I'm making a pledge to my Lord, and I'm going to seek him about these particular things, and I'm going to give you some direction, direction there, and, and my God is going to answer me, because he answers me. He's going to empower me, and he's going to communicate his will to me. The Hebrew word is S-U-M, sum, and it means to actually abstain from food. Now, sometimes in the past, I've encouraged people, if you have if, if you don't want to abstain from food, then fast something else. This particular fast, I'm going to encourage you to abstain from certain foods. Um, some people ask me, well, should I fast sin? Yeah, I'm like, yeah, you should always fast sin. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a lifestyle thing. That's something that you should fast every day. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah definitely fast sin, but I'm really encouraging you to, to, fast, to fast food. Um, you don't have to abstain from all foods. It doesn't have to be a juice diet. I'm practicing a Daniel fast, which means you're eating o only stuff that grows from the earth. But, but the whole point of it is denying yourself, your fleshly appetites, and looking to the Lord for, for guidance and direction. Because a fast without direction for the Lord or seeking the Lord or spending time in prayer is just a diet. We're not dieting. We're fasting. Because we're trying to understand the Lord's will for the coming year of 2018. That's what we're praying about. For you as individuals, 
but also for us as a congregation in Rochester as a city and a region. So it actually means in Hebrew to fast or abstain from food. Uh, it is interesting that nowhere in the Torah is fasting commanded. It's interesting. It's not, a, it's not a law, but it is something that they just began to do. Um, it starts out, uh, you know, Judges mentions fasting. I'm going to, I'm going to mention a bunch of passages, of passages of Scripture. But it's interesting that Jesus and his disciples sanctioned it. They began to practice it. Even before Jesus started his ministry, he fasted. For how long? 40 days and 40 nights before his ministry began. So Jesus is our elder brother, right? He's the one that teaches us how to build a relationship with the Father, how to be a good Christian, to be Christ-like. So it seems like we should model what he does. Now, we're only fasting two weeks. We're not fasting 40 days and 40 And he went without food for 40 days and 40 nights. Um, but Jesus, Jesus modeled it. And um, I love the Sermon on the Mount. And really, it's the magnum opus of all his, all his messages. It's, it's the first sermon, and it's certainly his most length, lengthy sermon, but it's interesting, there are two things that come out in that sermon that become the most important keys, I believe, to spiritual breakthrough. One, he talks about prayer. He gives direction and instruction on prayer. And he gives instruction on fasting. And I'm going to read those passages of Scripture. You can write these down for study later. Matthew 6, 5 and 6. It says, And when you pray, you will not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you that they have their reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you shut the door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. At the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, you have all the blessed, you know, blessed are the meek, blessed are those who are persecuted, and then it seems like he kind of expands on the law, which really he doesn't. He com communicates what the law, what the purpose of the law was all, all about. Um, he emphasizes a, a clean heart and a pure heart. And he's also speaking to the religious people today who were religious on the exterior, but they were, they were whitewashed tombs. They were like, they were serpents. They were evil and they were twisted, but they looked religious and godly on the outside but there was nothing. They were empty on the inside. Jesus was pointing to the fact that it's important that you change from the inside out. Be guided by your heart. So he was talking about the importance of a clean heart. So he mentions prayer. Don't do it like the Pharisees do. You go into a secret, a secret place. You come and you seek me. Humbly seek me, and I will reward you. There is a promise that when we go away and we pray and we seek the Lord, that he will answer that he will reward us. And I think some of us say, well, that's not the case really often for me. It's because you have not developed an ear to hear and eyes to see because he is speaking to you. And I believe the next couple of weeks, if you're one of those individuals who, who, well, I prayed before, I fasted before, and it does nothing for me. I believe that this ne these next couple of weeks, if you humbly go before him and say, Lord, I want to know your will and know you better. I want, I want to have an intimate relationship with you. I, I'm going to teach you some keys on how to hear God, God's voice. Because it's not writing on a wall. And it's not a big boom. It is, it is most often that still, silent voice. But I'm telling you, he's always speaking to us. And if you'll have eyes to see and ears to hear, you will see and you will hear. So he goes on in Matthew 6, 16 through 18, and he teaches on fasting. He says, Moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear to be men or, or appear to be fasting. Assuredly, I say to you, they have the reward. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so that you do not appear to men to be fasting but to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees you in the secret place will do what? He will reward you openly. Which means when you go away and you pray and you fast, there is a promise of a reward. When you go away and pray and you fast, expect to get an answer from God. 
Sometimes it's yes, sometimes it's no. Sometimes it's you need to wait. You know, but I'm telling you, he will answer you. Maybe not in the way that you expect. Maybe it's going to come from another person. Maybe it'll come through a dream. But he will answer you. That is a promise from Scripture. Fasting and prayer are inseparable. Again, you can't do that. You can't just fast and not pray. Again, just fasting without prayer is a diet. We're not dieting. We're fasting. We're denying fleshly appetites so that we can feed our spirit and the Holy Spirit can feed our spirit and we are centering our focus on the Lord and on the Holy Spirit. I want to talk about some, just mention some biblical references. I'm not going to read all these and uh, I don't expect you guys to keep up with me, but please write these references down so you can, you can read them later. So why do we fast? These are the biblical reasons to fast. It's a God-appointed way to humble yourself. Yes, that is even in Scripture. Luke 14, 11 says, For whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. God despises pride. It is the root of all sin. It is why Lucifer was cast out of heaven because of pride. Pride says, I'm going to do it my way, not God's way. And it doesn't have to be obstinate like that. It could just be you wake up Monday morning, and all you do is your stuff. you got your agenda, your punch list to get done. You don't think about what God wants you to do. You don't ask the Lord in the morning for his marching orders. You just go about your day. So it doesn't have to be an obstinate thing. Humbling yourself says, God, I want to do it your way. Your way. What is your desire for me Monday through Saturday or Monday through Sunday? Ezra was an Old Testament prophet. You could read these passages in chapter 7 and chapter, in chapter 8. He was seeking direction from the Lord, and he was calling for a fast. And he points something out, which is interesting, which touches on what I was just talking about. So King, King Artaxerxes of Persia made a decree to send Ezra back to Jerusalem after the Babylonian exile was over. But Ezra had butterflies in his stomach. He was nervous about going without an army. But he told, but he told the king that he, he wouldn't take an army, that he trusted God. And he says, I was ashamed to ask the king for a band of soldiers since we had told the king the hand of our God is for good upon all that seek him, and the power of his wrath is against all that forsake him. So, so Ezra proclaimed a fast, because the natural tendency in him would say, well, we need men, we need soldiers to come with us to protect us. But, but no, my God is faithful. I know my God is faithful. So what Ezra does, and this is recorded in chapter 8, verse 21 through 23, it says, then I proclaimed a fast there at the river Ahava, that we might humble ourselves before our God to seek from him the right way for us and our little ones and all of our possessions. For I was ashamed to request of the king an escort of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy on the road because we had spoken to the king saying, the hand of our God is upon all of those for good who seek him. But his power and his wrath are against all those who forsake him. So we fasted and we entreated our God for this. And he, and he answered our prayer. See, pride would say, God's not big enough for this. Pride gives in to fear. Takes the easy road. Ezra refused to do that. And to, make, to, to prepare himself and to pre prepare his people to receive of the Lord and also to minister to their soul, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, they fasted and they sought the Lord and the Lord strengthened them. Because the promise is, when you seek the Lord, the Lord will reward you. He will answer to you. Pride is always a barrier to answered prayer. In 1 Peter 5, 5-6, it says, Likewise, you younger people, submit yourself to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. That's an interesting phrase, clothed with, clothed. how do you clothe yourself with humility? Does anybody know? How do you clothe yourself? When you're, you're, when you're picturing clothing yourself with humility, you're picturing kind of putting something on, right? Clothes, 
you clothed yourself with humility. Do you know humility is not something that the Lord gives you? It's something that you have to exercise. He gives you the power to do it. But how do you act humbly? By not promoting self? By not, you know, having to draw attention to yourself? You know, by not being self-important? Those are, those are all things that you have to practice. So it's saying, clothe yourself hum- for, with humility. And if you do this, or, or God resists the proud. It, but if you do this, he gives grace. And grace means empowering. Empowering to live the godly life. If you choose to humble yourself, clothe yourself with humility, he will empower you through his Holy Spirit to be humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, and he may and he will exalt you in due time. There was a prophetic word that, that Prophet Hector shared. It was a while ago, and he's, he was talking about ministering to your, your soul. You need to take possession of your soul. And the passage of Scripture that that comes out of is in Luke 21, 19. It says, by patience, possess your soul. So it means to take possession of your soul. The Christian life is not automatic. How many of you find that out? It's not automatic. It's not natural. You're saved. You know you're saved. You're walking with God. But it's not easy. It's not easy to practice godliness. It's not natural. This is what this passage of Scripture is talking about. You have to create and build your soul in accordance with the new life that God has placed within you. There are certain things in life that we need to pray for. But then there are certain things in life that we don't need to pray for. You don't need to pray about your mood. How many of you are like moody sometimes? <laughs> you know, you get, you get like grumpy. You get, you get agitated. You get annoyed with family members. You know, you're going through a thing. And, you know, you're dealing with your moods. You don't say, Lord, take my mood away. No, you take possession of your own soul. Your soul is your mind your will, and your emotions. Outside circumstances don't control you. Outside circumstances do not control you. People can't make you mad. You choose to be mad at people. This is what this passage of Scripture is talking about. And the promise is that if we humble ourselves, and a way to humble ourselves is to fast and pray. So if we fast and pray... We will be empowered by the grace of God to take possession of our soul. So those of you who frequently struggle with grumpiness and irritability, you have the power within you to not be that way. Outside circumstances should not be controlling you. And this is something that fasting and prayer does. It helps you overcome those things. Take possession of your soul. You can get rid of moodiness. Isn't that nice? Isn't it nice to know that you don't have to be moody anymore? You don't have to be grumpy anymore. And you might, God might even be so gracious to you to put family members and friends in your life that remind you not to be moody. (laughs) Doesn't he do that? Isn't he so good? And how do you typically respond to people like that when they bring correction to you? You get more moody. You get irritable. But they're God's messengers to you. And he's saying... Take possession of your soul. Take possession of your soul. Your soul, And this is one of the ways that you can do this. By fasting. If you, if you are somebody that, that struggles repeatedly with things like that, or with sin or discouragement or lack of direction or revelation, fast and pray. And God promises to reward you and give you direction. Some of you wonder why you never hear from God. Because you never ask him anything. You don't talk to him. It's a reciprocal relationship. God's not just up there talking to you and not expecting you to to respond and talk to him back and ask him questions. And he's real big. He can handle your questions, even the tough ones. But he expects a relationship with you. These are the two primary ways you build a relationship with God. Three. Studying and reading his word by spending time in prayer and fasting. It's all over scripture. It's all over the Old Testament, all over the New Testament. 
But it's this become something we do seasonal. It is going to become a lifestyle for me. And I pray that it becomes a lifestyle from you. Here's some more biblical reasons to fast. Exodus, Exodus 34. Moses fasted. How long? 40 days. 40 days and 40 nights, and he met with God. And God instituted, this is, this is, this is the oxymoron, a fast. He instituted Sabbath rest. So it said that he fasted. And it's interesting that God instituted the Sabbath rest. He also communicated the commandments and the law and all sorts of things when Moses, Moses fasted. But he instituted rest. So I'm, I'm just declaring and proclaiming this over you. If you're a little bit stressed thinking about don't be stressed. I'm going to declare rest over you. I believe that this next two weeks, it's going to be easy. It's going to be easy. It's going to be easy to hear from the Lord. It's going to be easy to get direction. I re, I, I'm believing that. I'm, I'm declaring that over you. I'm declaring rest over you. And even after the two weeks, rest, but particularly this two weeks, this incredible rest and incredible download from the Lord as you honor him in this. Another passage, 2 Samuel 1.12. The Israelites fasted after the report of Saul and Jonathan's death. For they, they weren't really fasting for Saul and Jonathan because they were already dead. They were fasting because we have no leader. And now we need a leader. And they were mourning. And they fasted because they were mourning. So it's something that they did when they, when they were grieving and when they were mourning. Basically, so they would not give into their grief, give into their depression. They were fixing their attention on the Lord. Lord, you gird me up. You pick me up out of this. Because there is a time for grief. But then there's a time to move on from that grief. And that's what they were doing. So they fasted to mourn the loss of their king and his son, but also to seek direction for a new king. And they were probably also a little bit fearful at that point. <laughs> but they didn't want to give in to their fear. So they fasted and they prayed. Second Samuel 12, the whole chapter, read it. David fasted in an act of repentance before the Lord so that the Lord would spare his sick son. This was after his sin was exposed. So he fasted as an act of repentance, but he also fasted that the Lord would spare his son. The son wasn't spared, but the point was, this is something he knew that he needed to do to seek forgiveness and seek direction from the Lord, but also to seek healing for his household. In Esther 4.16, it's a, short, it's a short book. Read the whole book. I did that when I was just reading these passages of Scripture just because it's such a great story. But in Esther 4.16, she calls her people to fast so that, so that the fast would actually change the heart and mind of a pagan king that she happened to be married to. And she says this in Esther 4.16, Go, Gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan and fast for me. And neither eat nor drink three days or nights. I also and my maidservants will fast likewise. And so will I go unto the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. Because of the evil Haman, who wanted to, to destroy the Jews and the Jewish people, Esther decided to do something that was actually illegal for her to go by herself in the presence of the king, unless she was requested. So she was actually risking her life to do this. The king could actually legally execute her for this, and he would not have hesitated. But he, he did love Esther. God, God just made her a loving individual. <laughs> but So she asked the people to fast and pray. So she fasted and she prayed and had the people fast and pray for direction and also for a leader, a king. It's another reason why we should fast and pray. The second week, we're going to give some more direction about praying for our, you know, our, our region in our city of Rochester. I'm imagining that during that week that we're going to be lifting up people like our mayors and our, and our police chiefs and our, and our senators. But, you know, if, if, if God's people who are called by his name humble themselves and pray, he will bring healing to their land. We have to understand that the power of God is in us and gives us the authority to begin to shift and change those things. It was, it's what my father was speaking about before offering. 
He's given us this sort of authority. But if we're going to if we're going to know how to act, if we're going to know how to respond, if we're going to know what direction to take, we have to seek for the Lord's direction. And I believe, make fasting a lifestyle. Joel 2, God instructs his people to fast as an act of repentance and acknowledgement. Jonah 3, in, in chapter 3, even though Gina, Jonah didn't want to save these folks, they ended up, they end up being saved by the Lord and by Jonah's intervention because of his prophetic word. And the leaders of that community called together the people and they called them to prayer and fasting. It was like a national, national repentance. You know, as a nation, they wanted to repent before the Lord. And they did this through instituting a fast. And then, of course, in the New Testament, 2 Corinthians 6, 4 through 5, it says, fasting proved that you were a minister. Not just fasting. There was a list of other things, but in that list... In that list included fasting. It was assumed by Jesus and by the disciples that they would fast. It was just something that was assumed. He didn't didn't even say, go away and do this. It was just something that he assumed because it was the lifestyle that Jesus led and modeled. And they wanted their lives to be a reflection of Jesus's. So, So ministers of Christ practiced fasting. And then in Acts 3 and 4, the ecclesia at Antioch set apart Paul and Barnabas as apostles as directed by the Holy Spirit. All through the book of Acts, you see them praying, fasting, praying, fasting. And as soon as they would pray and fast, the reward would come. The answer would come. It says the Holy Spirit would direct them. Direct them over picking who, who to appoint elders. Or what elders to appoint over, over certain towns what apostles to set apart, where to go, what to say. They would fast and they would pray and God would answer and give them specific direction. Now again, that direction is sometimes, actually often, quiet. But if you have a sensitivity to hear from the Lord, if you've you've developed your spiritual senses, you will get the direction that you're, you're asking for. And he will lead you. He wants to lead you. He wants to guide you. He doesn't want you to be spinning in circles. That's not who our God is. Our God is a God that leads. And when we seek him, we'll find him. Acts 13.2, the ecclesia prayed and fasted before setting apart elders. Whenever they had a, actually, I was going to say whenever they had a big decision, but they weren't always big decisions. They were small decisions. It's like, what city do you want us to minister to next? They would fast and they'd pray about it and the Holy Spirit would tell them where to go. How many of you have you ever been, been like traveling on vacation and decided to take, well, I'm going to take this road because I think that road's going to be faster, and it's not? <laughs> you run into a traffic jam or a tree falls in the road. You know, those are actually things that you can pray about, and the Lord will give you, give you direction. He protects his children, and he directs his children. And the, and the disciples knew about this, so... In, in every significant decision, every important decision, they would go away and pray and fast. Does that mean you have to pray and fast about everything? That is not what I'm saying. But I would almost like you to go away with that because I don't think that we pray and fast enough about stuff. You know, but you, know, you don't have to pray about the color of the shirt that you're going to wear in the morning. You don't have to pray about those things. If you want to, fine. And I bet you the Lord will answer because I bet you he's got a favorite color. I don't know. I mean, he might. He likes them all. I don't have a favorite color. I like them all. There are two types of fasting in Scripture. This doesn't jump right out to you, but there are individual fasts and there are corporate fasts. The corporate fast, I was was reading through quite a bit in the Old Testament. Um, Often these leaders would call together the people to pray and fast. So it was a corporate fast. But there were many individual fasts. Throughout, throughout Acts, there are individual fasts that Paul would practice as he was seeking direction for the Lord or he was seeking healing of an individual or salvation of a community. So those are the two types of fasts that are in Scripture. Um, now I want to give you some direction about our fast. So if you want to take out your, your flyer and just kind of take a look at that. I'm actually going to read a little bit of what Laura wrote in response to some of the things that I was asking her to do because I think it gives some really significant, important direction for us 
the next the next two weeks. Um, she's, I, I think it really sets us up for the fast in, in a, oh, I'm sorry. I used the Habakkuk portion that you mentioned yesterday as the introductory scripture as we begin the fast. I'll talk about that in a second. I think it really sets us up fast in a clear way, encouraging us to take our place, watching and listening to see what, and, and hear what the Lord wants to show us as we prepare for the new year. The scriptures I chose are primarily addressing the apostolic church in regard to our assignments and the requirements for victory. Do you know that you have an assignment? Everyone in this sanctuary has an assignment. Some of you may be unaware of it. I believe the Holy Spirit wants to make you aware of your assignment. It's, it's one of the things that you're going to be praying for, particularly this week. We will let the Holy Spirit highlight in each person's life the thing that they should focus and, and pray on and from, from the passages of Scripture that are given. The first week is a closer look at ourselves in our life together at Bethel, and the hard attitudes we need to maintain in order to fulfill the assignments that the Lord is giving us. That's why I talked about the importance of knowing how to minister to your soul, not being controlled by your circumstances, not being co- controlled by other individuals, because you don't have to be, and you're not supposed to be. Then the second week, we can focus on needs in our community, our assignments from God, and the posture we need to take as we respond to the culture in the arenas he is asking us to influence with his love and his truth. So the first week is our own lives in our community at Bethel. This is kind of the focus for this week. In the scripture passages this week, each day will go along with that. And I would encourage you, before you open up your Bible, spend some time in prayer. Ask the Lord what he will show you as you read those passages of Scripture. We're not going to give a ton of direction during this because I know the Lord is going to speak to you. To you. He wants to speak to you. So before you get into these passages, spend some time in prayer and, of course, be fasting these these, uh, two weeks. And then the second week, our city and our region, and I'll give some direction and focus to that, Next Sunday, you don't have to pay a lot of attention to that. Just focus on your own lives in the community here, the congregation here at Bethel, your family. I want to read this passage of Scripture. Last week, my dad, Apostle Ron, spoke on, was it last week? Rest. Yes, last week he spoke on rest. Um, The Monday before that, we had a, um, a, a land meeting, a pastor's gathering, and Pastor, or Prophet Hector came with a word about rest. He, he had a dream. That same morning, a pastor has a message, and one of his main points was about rest, his first point, which he said, I don't need to go over it because Prophet Hector just shared about rest. That same morning, he gave me a passage of Scripture in Habakkuk 2, 1 through 4, and there were a lot of other people that received similar words. So when that happens, ding, something should go off. Okay, Lord, you're, you're, you're communicating something to us. You're, you're emphasizing something. So I believe that this coming year, 2018, is going to be a season of rest. And when we rest, which means when we trust God, he will reward us with that trust, and we will begin to see things happen. We will see breakthrough. So I'm believing, again, for breakthrough in your life. So let me read this passage of Scripture. It's in Habakkuk 2. One through four, and this is going to give you some prayer direction for the next couple weeks. <clears throat> Habakkuk 2, one through four. I will stand my watch and set myself on the rampart. And a rampart is like a wall that surrounds, a protective wall that surrounds a city. That's, that's the picture that you should get when you're reading this. Here we have Habakkuk seeking the Lord for direction. And he, and he goes up on the city wall and it's, a, it's, it's most likely in the evening, nobody else is there, or it's certainly very quiet, and everybody else, most, most people are sleeping with the exception of a few, a few people stationed on that wall. So he's up there on the rampart, and he's seeking the Lord. And he says, keep watch, which means to look out or to observe, to see, which also means, if, if you research the, the Hebrew, quiets himself within and waits for God to answer. That's what it means, watch and see. You quiet yourself within, and you wait for God to answer. So this is what Habakkuk was doing. 
And he will say to me, and what I will answer when I am corrected. Then the Lord answered me and said, write the vision and make it plain on tablets, that, that he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak and will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by faith. This gives us incredible prayer instruction while we fast. And I remember reading this in a book on prayer that I, that I read. This is really powerful, something that I've not practiced consistently, but, but have practiced. On my nightstand or in my drawer, probably in multiple drawers, probably on my, under my bed, on the side of my light stand, uh, nightstand, I have pads of paper everywhere. My wife collects them every once in a while. She's, she's actually, she cleaned my nightstand drawer and put some of those pads of paper for me to put away properly someplace on my nightstand. But I will have a piece of, a, a pad of paper by my bed because I can't tell you how many times I wake up in the morning with God thoughts, revelation, or passages of scripture. There's something precious about the morning before you start the day. If you focus on the things of God as you're, as you're going to bed and as you wake up, wake up in the morning, you will often wake up with, with scriptures to encourage you, uh, maybe just a word, sometimes, sometimes a person's name that the, that the Holy Spirit wants you to pray about. But, but it's a very important time during the day for you to communicate with the Lord because there's something precious about the morning. David would o- often seek the Lord in the morning. Um, so there's, there's four, four points, four prayer direction that I'd like to give you from this passage of Scripture. Habakkuk goes up on the rampart because he's trying to find a place that's away, separate, but it's also kind of a high place where you can see. So he's expecting to watch and see. He's expecting God to answer him. So um, also watch and see mean, means to rest. So it means to still yourself. This is why I'm declaring rest the next couple of weeks as you participate in this, that, that you're just going to experience rest. Like, you're not even going to get stressed about, what, what do I pray about? You know, maybe I should have a list of people that... Don't, don't worry about that. I really believe the Holy Spirit will give you names, give you things to pray about, but don't do that on your own. Rest. Be still. That's the direction that Habakkuk gives us. And then, use the vision that God gives you. God answered him, and he got a vision. And, he, and when he got that vision, he was expecting to write it down. Now, this is, this is, this is a learned habit, hearing from the Lord. It's a learned habit. Because oftentimes you'll hear from the Lord, but you won't know it's him because you ha- don't recognize his voice. We are his sheep, and we have to learn to recognize the voice of the shepherd. This is cultivated. The reason why you think that God isn't speaking to you is because you have not developed those senses yet. This is one of the reasons why we fast. Deny our flesh so that our spirit begins to lead us and guide us and direct us through the Holy Spirit. So quiet yourself, rest, use the vision that God gives you. If a name pops into your head, write it down. Have a pad of paper with you the next couple weeks and even beyond this or your phone, whatever you use to write stuff down, write those things down, names of people, write them down. Passages of scripture, write them down. Read them, study them. Pray about them because that's God speaking to you. You might even get something random, crazy, and obscure. Now, if, it, if it's not to do something stupid and dangerous, it probably is the Holy Spirit, but you can't wrap your mind around it yet. He might even give you direction that causes you to say, I can't do that. I, I, I can't say that. Now, I guarantee if he's going to do that, it's going to be edifying. It's not going to be like you know, criticism against an individual or judgment against an individual, but it may be something that's kind of like out of the ordinary. God does that sometimes. The Holy Spirit does that to me sometimes. He'll give me a dream, and it will be like, this can't possibly have any spiritual meaning whatsoever. 
but I'll pray about it, and the Lord will give me revelation. I'm actually going to share a dream with you that he gave me just before this fast that I believe it's, a, that it's not just for me, it's for you. It's to excite you. But So stillness, rest, use the vision that God gives you. Spontaneity is important. When you're seeking the Lord and you get those names or those scriptures or those revelations, write them down. That is most likely from the Holy Spirit. Just assume it is God because you're seeking him and he wants to answer. And then write them down. We really need to make a habit out of journaling. This is something that I'm not good at. But the stuff that I've written down that, I've, that, that I thought, you know, this is really important. I'm going to go back to it someday. I end up going back to it and getting greater, greater revelation about where I am now. It's like, that's why he said that to me. That's why that person shared that dream with me and I had no idea what it meant. Now I know what it means. So that's why it's important for you to write it down because if you're like me, you're not going to remember all that stuff. I mean, there's, there's certain passages of Scripture that I write in the front of all of my Bibles because it is, is a Scripture that has significant meaning to me because it marks a turning point or some sort of great revelation that the Lord gave me as I sought him. So stillness, rest, vision. God wants to give you vision, and it's going to be spontaneous, and you write it down, you journal about it. And I want to hear what the Lord is speaking to you. Um, I'm, going to be, I'm going to be posting some things on Facebook. You can respond to those posts. I'd really like to hear what God is speaking to you, if it's something that you could share with us. Some of it might, may be private stuff, because God's going to minister to us during that time. And it may be private stuff, but if it's not, I want to be hearing from you, comments on, on Facebook. Um, and I want to conclude with this. Uh, can I have the worship team come up? I want to share this dream. I wish Carl Wagger was here. Is Carl Wagger here? Carl, Carl has had uh, shingles, and he's on, on the men, but I miss seeing Carl. His wife was, was here last week on the front row, but um, I, I, I only mention that because Carl was in my dream. <clears throat> So I was, with, uh, I was with Carl, and we were in this uh, huge auditorium, bigger than this. It was, like, it was like the Blue Cross Arena. It was huge. And um, people were gathering together. The, the, seats, the seats were full, but everybody was standing, and their arms were raised, and they were, worshiping, they were worshiping the Lord, and they were praying and fasting. I don't know how I knew this. Well, I knew that they were praying, but I didn't know that they were fa- I just knew that they were. They were praying, and they were fasting. They were making declarations, and there were prophetic words. And uh, there was just all sorts of things happening. And for some, I, 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 wasn't, I wasn't standing. I was sitting, and I was just talking to Carl about this. And Carl and I were getting really excited about what was going to break, break loose, what was going to happen. And then the Holy Spirit spoke to me, and he said, and he said this. And I'll elaborate it on a, bit, on a, a little bit because I didn't, it's, it's like I'm getting progressive revelation of what this means. The Holy Spirit spoke to me, and he said, I'm pulling back the curtain and I will cause my people to see. And it was, it was a large auditorium, but it was like we were at a play, at a production, and the curtain was about to unfold, and, and the Lord was going to reveal something. And I believe what the Lord, it, Lord is telling us is that I'm going to pull back the curtain for all of you because some of us, you know, we see through that glass darkly. Some of us feel like there's been a curtain that's been drawn in front of us, and we can't, we can't see clearly, we can't discern, discern clearly. I'm really believing for you as individuals, this has corporate significance, but for you as individuals, that the Lord is going to be pulling back that curtain. So expect that. God is going to be pulling back that curtain, that you're going to be getting words from the Lord, that there's going to be certain gifts in you that, that, are, that were lying dormant, that, that are going to rise up, and, and God's going to do miraculous and wondrous things. And I really believe that we are moving into a season as the ecclesia in the city of, city of Rochester, that God is going to be co- pulling back his curtain. Like, like when, they would, when they would fast, God would reward them openly. I believe as we seek the Lord for direction through prayer, studying the word, in fasting, practicing this lifestyle, God will reveal us to the world. It's so like the curtain is going to be drawn back for them and they will see God in God events through us, and they will give glory to God, and many salvations will become will come because of this. I'm, I'm believing that. I, I know that that's what that dream, dream means, and I, and I think God's going to be speaking to me more about that. I probably have more to share next Sunday, but he's pulling back the curtain. Isn't that exciting? Amen.
All right, so can you stand up? I have one more passage of Scripture I want to read to you, and I want to read it as a declaration, but also as, as a prayer of repentance. Let's, let's just do this. There are, there are things in our lives that the Lord has been challenging us with. Let's submit them to the Lord as, as we begin this fast. Let's just start it out right. So the, the prayer starts out as a prayer of repentance. <clears throat> but, and then it, then it begins to talk about how the Lord is going to bless us and bless the fruit of our labor and bless the land. And then it ends with a whole lot of exciting stuff that I believe is going to be happening the next couple weeks. So just close your eyes. Lift your, lift your hands to the heavens and just, just receive this. <clears throat> this is God's personal message to us. Come back to me and really mean it. Come fasting and weeping. Sorry for your sins. Change your life, not just your clothes. Come back to God, your God. And here's why. God is kind. And he's merciful. He takes a deep breath. He puts up with a lot. This most patient God, extravagant in love, always ready to cancel catastrophe. Who knows? Maybe he'll do it now. Maybe he'll turn around and show pity. Maybe when all's said and done, there'll be blessings full and robust from your God. Blow the ram's horn in Zion. Declare a day of repentance, a holy fast. Call a public meeting. Get everyone there. Consecrate the congregation. Make sure the elders come, but bring in the children too, even the nursing babies, even men and women on their honeymoon. Interrupt them and get them there. Between sanctuary entrance and altar, let the priests, God's servants, weep tears of repentance. Let them intercede. Have mercy, God, on your people. Fear not the earth. Be glad and celebrate. God has done great things. Fear not wild animals. The fields and meadows are greening up. The trees are bearing fruit again. A bumper crop of fig trees and vines. Children of Zion, celebrate. Be glad in your God. He's giving you a teacher to train you how to live right. Teaching like rain out of heaven. Showers of words to refresh and nourish your soul just as he used to do. And plenty of food for your body. Silos full of grain casks of wine and barrels of olive oil. I'll make up for the years of the locust, the great locust devastation. Locust savage, locust deadly, fierce locust, locust of doom, that great locust invasion I sent your way. You'll eat your fill of good food. You'll be full of praises to your God, the God who has set you back on your heels in wonder. Never again will my people be despised. You will know without question that I'm in the thick of life with you. That I'm your God, yes, your God, the one and only real God. Never again will my people be despised, and that is just the beginning. After that, I will pour out my spirit on every kind of people. Your sons will prophesy, also your daughters. Your old men will dream dreams. Your men will see visions. I will pour out my spirit on the servants. Men and women both, I will set wonders in the sky above and signs on the earth below. And I declare this over you, says the Lord. Just praise him. Praise him. We receive it, Lord. We receive it. We expect it. Lord, you're a good God and you reward those who diligently seek you. We will seek you. We will seek for your guidance. We will seek your repentance. And Lord, we will expect breakthrough because you are a good father and you love your children. You love your sons and daughters and you've set us apart. You've marked us. You've sealed us with your Holy Spirit and you set us in 2017. Such a time as this to move towards the future of great restoration in our city and in our personal lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's worship the Lord.